much, uh, Mr. Wareham. We'll go next uh, to the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Uh, David McDonald, Senior Economist. Uh, welcome back, David. You've been here before. The floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks so much for the committee for their, their invitation to speak today. Uh, first of all, I mean, I would like to congratulate the federal government on its, on its reaction to this crisis, and in particular on the creation of the uh, emergency benefit. It was certainly a highlight of government action in this pandemic, as I've remarked before, before this committee. Uh, and while the two-month extension to the CERB is welcome, I would encourage the government to start planning now towards a new modern EI system with a transition strategy to that end. Some of the features of a new EI system should be borrowed from the success of CERB, including its speed, a minimum payment, say $500 a week, and in particular, better coverage for gig and self-employed workers. However, I would like to focus my comments today on the government's interventions into the financial sector, with programs, uh, which programs have been taken up, which ones haven't, and, and how we could improve those interventions. I think it's worth taking stock of the approximately $750 billion promised in support for the financial sector. By my count, $679 billion of this amount has been deployed. Uh, the reduction in the bank's domestic stability buffer has provided them with an additional $300 billion if they choose to use it. The Bank of Canada was initially scheduled to spend $300 billion, although its balance sheet has now expanded to $373 billion as of last Wednesday. Almost half of that expansion is due to the increase in its uh, repurchase agreements. On the other hand, the mortgage purchase program through CMHC has managed to buy almost no mortgages, spending only $6 billion of its $150 billion budget, with the last two purchases buying essentially nothing, uh, and the next one scheduled for June 22nd next week. The lowering in particular the domestic stability buffer from 2.25% to 1% of risk-weighted assets would free up as much as $300 billion in assets for other purchases uh, for financial actors. OSFI would prefer if those purposes were to provide further loans to businesses or households. However, this assumes that banks can find households or businesses who are both credit worthy and are willing to take on another $300 billion in debt in the middle of the worst labor market since 1936. That $300 billion could be used for other purposes, much less desirable than lending, as within any large corporation, money is fungible and its purposes can change. For instance, it could be used to pay out shareholders, executives, or it could be used to cover loan losses. Thankfully, OSFI has explicitly barred banks from continuing with any existing share buyback programs. However, dividend payment payments and executive bonuses can be maintained but not increased. In the first quarter of 2020, the banks paid out $5 billion in dividends, and they are on track to pay out $22 billion to shareholders uh, over the course of 2020. In other words, 7% of the gain from the change in the stability buffer could still be paid out to shareholders despite OSFI rules as they stand today. While senior financial executives will not be able to increase their total pay above what they stood in the previous years, given ever increasing executive pay in Canada, this is hardly a stringent restriction. In 2018, the top executives at Canadian banks raked in $173 million in bonuses alone across 31 people. If this is the pay bar that they have to fit under given extraordinary government supports for the sector, it likely won't cause them any difficulty. I would recommend that this committee examine international approaches like those in the EU or the UK that suspended bank dividends and executive bonuses for the period of extraordinary government supports. A Bank of Canada study released earlier this month found that the deferral of mortgage payments is an important way to keep Canadians who've temporarily lost work in their homes and reduce the likelihood of a downward spiral of net worth through a rushed home sale. With 14% of all mortgages now in a deferral position, this has been a lifeline to the 4.8 million Canadians who've lost their jobs or the majority of their hours since February. OSFI is allowing the banks not to have to increase their capital requirements due to non-performing loans makes this crisis of mortgage repayments much cheaper for the banks if they engage in a deferral process. With between 12 to 18% of mortgages presently in deferral, depending on the bank, increased capital requirements would have otherwise led to material impact on the bank's bottom lines. I'd encourage the committee to request the banks not charge interest and other penalties on or over the deferral period of mortgages, but not only on mortgages, also on higher interest products like credit cards and lines of credit. Given the slow recovery so far, I'd recommend the committee also considering extending the loan deferral period 
from September until the end of 2020. Furthermore, many Canadians simply won't get their jobs back, even by the end of the year, and many will conclude that it isn't financially viable to stay in their present homes. The mortgage costs will just be too high given job losses. Mortgages, particularly fixed rate ones, carry substantial penalties for early repayment. The committee should consider reducing or eliminating these prepayment penalties, allowing Canadians more easily to sell houses they can no longer afford and get into new houses they can afford without paying extraordinary penalties in the process. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McDonald. And before I turn to uh, Mr. Porter, I'll give uh, members the uh, the lineup for the first round of questions. Uh, first up will be Mr. Polyev, followed by Mr. Fraser, then Mr. St. Marie, and uh, Mr. Uh, Julian. Uh, Mr. Uh, Porter, uh, Bank of Montreal, uh, welcome. Uh, you had some technical problems like uh, we folks in the country often have. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Well, all's well that ends well. And uh, good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you today. I'll keep my remarks relatively uh, brief because I uh, largely agree with those who spoke on uh, on the economic uh, outlook earlier. Uh, in brief, Canada's just experienced the uh, the deepest and sharpest economic downturn uh, in the post-war era, but it also now looks to have uh, been the shortest recession ever as well as there are plenty of signs uh, that activity, jobs, and spending uh, began to recover in May alongside the initial stages of the reopening in many parts of the country and through uh, the rest of the world. Uh, but while some of the latest economic indicators are no doubt encouraging, there's also a little doubt that we're climbing out of a deep valley. Uh, preliminary evidence from Statistics Canada, as earlier mentioned, suggests that the economy fell by 17% in March and April alone, and that may well be revised even higher to a deeper decline. And again, to put that in context, the previously largest decline was in the early 1980s recession when output fell by just a little bit more than 5% over one and a half years. Um, as economies uh, reopen, a large, uh, sh we think a large share of this drop can be re re reversed and relatively quickly. However, it's also apparent that in the absence of an effective vaccine, uh, certain sectors will remain heavily constrained for an extended period of time, uh, likely constraining the overall economy. And crucially, most of these sectors that will remain constrained do tend to have above average employment levels. So if anything, the employment effect of uh, the constrained sectors will be even more than what the, uh, the overall GDP numbers uh, suggest. So even uh, though we currently project a set rebound in activity next year after we believe a similar decline this year, that would still leave the economy three to 4% below where it normally would have been by the end of next year. And the unemployment rate is likely to be two to three percentage points higher than pre-crisis levels, even by the end of uh, 2021. Uh, moreover, uh, the economy does face an important challenge transitioning from the initial reopening phase uh, to the recovery phase. So even as the, the need for the most extreme policy measures do fade, uh, the economy will require, as mentioned earlier, uh, support for a longer period of time. And policy will need to strike the appropriate balance between supporting incomes and not discouraging work incentives. And while we recognize it is still a highly uncertain environment, the upcoming fiscal snapshot is welcome, as it will help to uh, give us all a firm foundation uh, for future decisions. Uh, looking further out over the medium term, we are relatively upbeat on the prospects for the recovery. Uh, individuals and businesses are incredibly resourceful, as we have seen in recent months, and they can learn to deal with challenging circumstances. So we don't we don't think we should discount the uh, the ability of the economy to uh, to recover. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, to you, Mr. Porter, and to uh, all the witnesses uh, for their presentations. Uh, the uh, first round will be uh, a six-minute round, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Polyev. Uh, Pierre, the floor is uh, yours. Your mic's on, Pierre. Thank you very much for your testimony, everyone. Uh, whatever, whichever bank economists wish to answer this question can jump in. I'm just looking for the number here, not for any commentary. But what share of your bank's assets are backed up by the government? By backed up, I mean have guarantees by the government directly or indirectly in the form of CMHC 
or 90% backups of of Canada guarantee and Genworth uh, and other forms of guarantees. What percentage? If you don't have an answer to that question, feel free just not to chime in on this question. Okay, who wants to take it? No volunteers? Um, Go ahead, Mr. Zendveld. So I think the silence is that we don't run these banks. So we don't always know everything about banking. Uh, They don't let me run the bank at least. Uh, But what I would say is that that share has come down substantially. So, uh, you know, the CMHC, for example, not only used to uh, guarantee mortgages for people who didn't have the 20% down payment, but also had a program where they, where basically the bank could buy the CMHC insurance in bulk on mortgages that, the buyer didn't require the insurance, uh, and banks were doing that and then using that to right. Uh, so, the portfolio. so that's yeah. fallen a lot. Whatever that yeah. number is, down substantially. But I don't know the number, and I okay. I, I don't see any other volunteers. Um, but it'd be. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I don't want any commentary on that. I just need numbers. Um, do you have numbers, Dave, Mr. McDonald? Raw numbers, yes, sir. Okay, uh, fire away. The, the maximum insurance in force allowed through CMHC is just over seven hundred billion. On residential mortgages, the total uh, residential mortgage value in Canada is roughly 1.2 trillion. Uh, and so this isn't a bank by bank breakdown, uh, but the what is uh, seven divided by 12 is your ratio. That yeah, that's just so so about 60 percent ish. Uh, that's Mr. just mortgages, though. That's just mortgages, yeah. right? Mortgages. Yeah. So banks have yeah. lots of other assets like loans. Uh, of course. To of course, but it just, I guess sometimes I wonder why banks have so little concern about the indebtedness of Canadian households, not all of them, but some of uh, have been, uh, have not expressed the kind of alarm that I see when I look at the numbers. Um, and it, it seems to me that's partly because banks are protected against any future um, serious meltdown uh, and defaults uh, because their largest consumer Mortgage uh, consumer uh, lending book is to uh, to to homeowners who are whose mortgages are backed up by the government, and therefore the the risk is really with taxpayers rather than bankers. Um, and uh, and so I, I'm very worried about the degree of debt we have in this country. Uh, before the crisis, we were at 356 percent of GDP, public and private combined, which is the second highest in the G7, only after Japan, and that was all before. COVID-19. Um, do any of the witnesses uh, want to co- comment on the serious possibility of some sort of debt crisis or crunch that could befall our, our public or private sectors uh, as a result of those high levels of debts and the eventual and inevitable increase in interest rates in the medium term? Okay, who wants to uh, go for that one? Uh, Ms. Cooper, uh, go, go, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I think it's important to understand exactly, you know, drill down into the mortgage debt and credit card debt parts of household debt. Um, or let's call it collateralized debt versus credit card debt. Um, in terms of collateralized debt, um, it's, it's really quite interesting that 40% of Canadian homeowners don't even have a mortgage. And the, the Bank of Canada estimates that it's roughly 12% of Canadian homeowners that have mortgages that are at what the bank considers excessive levels. Um, the, the, the fact is that 58% of Canadian households have virtually no debt at all. In other words, debt of less than $25,000. And a lot of the time, the, the policymakers seem to be most concerned about housing debt as opposed to credit card debt which is certainly not my point of view, and not just because I work for a mortgage lender, but because from a personal perspective, I've never 
paid right. just the minimum on a credit card. Right. And I've taught my son not to do well, that either because interest Cooper, rates I, are I, so high. Ms. Cooper, I think if everyone was as good with money as you are, then our nation would be in spectacular financial shape. But um, I'm concerned about the people who are not within the 40% of mortgage-free Canadians. And uh, I'm concerned about the others who, who are mortgaged. And the fact that, that there is such a large group of people who have limited debt means that in order for us to arrive at the total household debt ratio of 177%, then there must be another group of people that are extraordinarily indebted. Yes. And who are these people who are bringing up the national household indebtedness average and how vulnerable are they to a major credit event? Uh, Ms. Cooper and or anybody else who wants to testify. So who wants to go with that? Uh, uh, David, Mc, uh, Mr. McDonald, you're on. Thank you very much for the for the question. I do want to revise my earlier statement. I have, in fact, looked it up at the end of uh, the first quarter of 2020, 30% of all mortgages uh, in Canada were insured by the federal government, by CMHC. In any event, um, to your point, Mr. Polyevra, uh, the higher debt is primarily being held among younger households uh, who did not get it into the housing market early enough and therefore did not have substantial amounts of equity that a lot of Canadians have seen uh, being run up since about 2002. Uh, and they're also uh, more commonly in big cities where housing prices are very high. And so certainly uh, high household debt, as well as high corporate debt, I mean, corporate debt has risen quite substantially in the last five years, uh, means that lower interest rates that would otherwise encourage households and businesses to take out more loans are much less effective. And so despite the fact that we're at zero interest rates, it's not very useful. We're not seeing okay. tremendous economic growth as a result. Any chance I can squeeze in one last uh, short You're already question? a minute over, but I'll be kind today because okay. I know you want to very much want another question. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. <laughs> um, my question first to Mr. McDonald and then anyone else who wants to jump in. Um, in the post-2008 financial crisis in the United States, massive quantitative easing effectively inflated asset values and represented a major wealth transfer to people who owned assets while effectively reducing the value of the wages that working class and impoverished Americans earned. Um, now we have this same quantitative easing in Canada, 400, almost 400 billion of it. Uh, Mr. McDonald, do you believe that the, the, the creation of all this money is just going to, and again, inflate the assets of the very wealthy uh, and reduce the value of the real value of the wages of the working class? And anyone else can jump in if they want as well. Okay, Mr. McDonald, and I'll look for a hand if there's anybody else, and we'll let him move on. Mr. McDonald, okay, and then Mr. Schenfeld. Thanks. Thanks so much for the question. Uh, certainly, the Bank of Canada has has actually always been engaged in buying some portion of federal government debt uh, that's ranged from about five percent in the 1980s to about 15 percent recently. It was as high as 25 percent in the 1970s. Uh, and given the recent purchases of the federal government of the Bank of Canada federal government, that it will likely rise to in the neighborhood of 27 percent. Um, that's not it is certainly higher, uh, you know, than we've seen historically, but not out of all range. Um, you know, the, the main concern of the, the Bank of Canada purchasing that much federal government debt is the creation of inflation, um, which is a particular concern if economy, economies are at full capacity, uh, with 25 percent of our labor force being unemployed since February or losing the majority of their hours, that's hardly a concern, as well as two months of negative inflation, not positive inflation. I don't think that's a, a terrible concern, but... Uh, okay, that's, Mr. That's Mr. Schenfeld, uh, fairly tight, if you could. Yeah, I would just uh, echo that. Um, many countries experimented with similar quantitative easing programs after the 2008 recession. Canada had a milder recession, so we didn't have to do that. None of those countries were left with a legacy of inflation. So while the premise of the question is right, that asset values are protected, and we're trying to do that, in fact, to retain some business confidence, to let, uh, but also to suppress interest rates. Uh, and remember, the government is borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars to finance this rescue effort. Um, I think it's quite good that they're borrowing at a half a percent interest rate as opposed to two. Um, and to for the now. extent that, for now, no, but I mean, this is, this is giving the government the opportunity to lock in some fairly good low rates. Um, and again, none of the countries that did QE ended up with soaring interest rates afterwards, nor did they end up with soaring inflation. So by and large, I'd say that the Bank of Canada has shown a lot of wisdom 
in using this extraordinary tool to deal with an extraordinary recession. Okay, we'll have to move on to uh, Mr. Fraser. And I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Fraser, you won't get quite as much time. <laughs> Go ahead, John. My God, you can never get a fair shake here. Uh, th thanks, Mr. Chair. I got lots of questions. I'll try to keep them tight, and I'd ask that the witnesses do the same in the response. I'll go first to Mr. Schenfeld. Um, there was a, a certain level of optimism, uh, frankly, that I've heard that within a few years, we're probably going to get, to get back to 2019 levels of, of um, uh, economic production in Canada. Uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is um, not being satisfied that uh, we, we get there in a few years, uh, but what happens to those those people who are living on the bubble in the intervening period. I'm curious if you have advice for us on what we can do during the transition and recovery, not only to get our GDP back to where it might have been in 2019 or employment, unemployment levels, uh, but where, where we can also ensure that we mitigate against the possibility of widespread bankruptcies at the household or small business level. So I, I think, first of all, getting back to the level of GDP doesn't get you back to the same unemployment rate because uh, population grows, you actually have to be well above the previous level of GDP. So we're going to be in this soup for a while. And I think your, your premise of your question is absolutely right. Uh, government programs are going to have to play a role in protecting against insolvencies. Yes, I'm a banker, but I actually care about people going bust because they also have our credit cards, not just mortgages that are insured. But as a Canadian, I also want to see our economy get through this slumber period and that means partly ensuring that households have some spending power when this is all done. So um, I think the, the right approach is certainly to look at all the various things that we're now doing for businesses and for households. Um, and we're going to manage them down to some extent as un unemployment falls. I mean, the cost of these programs will come down as job opportunities open up. We're going to have to provide in appropriate incentives. So, for example, the CERB program has one not so great feature that if I earn $1,000, I get a $2,000 check. But if I earn $1,001, I get nothing. So someone who's earning $1,000 a month has no incentive to look for a job that's going to pay them another $500. Um, and similarly, the program that was designed for the wage subsidy had a particular cutoff. Um, so we're going to need to re-examine these. And unfortunately, we now have some time uh, to do that. And and to design the programs in a way that provides some incentives. But nevertheless, the support programs in some form have to stay in place because otherwise we do get a wave of bankruptcies. I mean, we're going to see some of that anyway. We can't rescue all businesses. I think Sherry suggested that. I think she's right. There are going to be things that unfortunately go under um, and households that are going to struggle and banks have taken some pretty big hits in their recent quarter earnings to provide for the losses associated with that. Uh, but I think government still has to play a big role here. It's a long wait for the economy to be good again. Uh, thank you. That, that's a good segue into my next question, which I'll direct to Mr. Perot. Uh, Mr. Schenfeld made the point on one occasion during his remarks that it's not particularly costly right now uh, to uh, to borrow to cover some of the cost of these programs that that were really created by the, uh, the uh, pandemic. Um, we've made the decision that the federal government is better positioned than households and businesses to bear those costs. Um, Mr. Perot, you uh, you made the point um, uh, th that um, uh, there there may come a time when that may not be the case. Uh, I'm curious if, if the uh, the pandemic is the um, uh, the, the source point uh, of these these increased costs. Uh, is there a tipping point? What indicators should we be looking for when we should say? The federal government is no longer the um, the organization that should be bearing this cost, but perhaps it should go to a different level of government or to households or businesses, uh, because I have a hard time seeing where they will be better positioned to incur these costs than will be the federal government. I mean, it's it's a great question. Like the fundamental challenge that uh, I think the country is dealing with now is, you know, sure there is lots of debt in the country. There's no question. When you when you layer it all together. As, as uh, uh, Mr. Polyev indicated, we are a highly indebted country. Um, but we are in this very difficult economic circumstance that requires a tremendous amount of support to get us through to the other side. And the question very much is, who's got the best balance sheet to do that? And it's clearly not households. It's clearly not provincial governments. It's clearly not municipal governments. They can't even do anything. It's going to fall on, on the federal government. So even as we, even in a worst case scenario, and with the, with the resurgence of the virus and requiring, you know, an extension of the CERB or, or 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 sustained wage subsidies or massive amounts of money going into training programs, if that were to be required at some point in time, 
we're still in a world where, you know, the federal government is going to be the entity with the best balance sheet to help us manage that. Now, at some point, market, markets may not agree with that, uh, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's the reality as far as I can see it at, the, at, the, at present. Thank you for okay, that feedback, ahead, Mr. Chair. Have I got time for one quick yep, one? Yep. Yeah. Uh, e- excellent. Uh, this is to Ms. Cooper. I was um, uh, fascinated by by your testimony. Uh, there was a number of pieces that jumped out. So thank you for being here. Uh, one of the points that you made was that the federal government should be looking to support viable businesses that will essentially be able to stand on their own two feet in the back end of this pandemic. We don't want to throw good money after bad. And I completely agree. Uh, however, there is a part of me that uh, wonders, uh, is the federal government government really the uh, the body to, to pick winners? and losers, uh, because quite frankly, the private sector can can surprise people. Uh, there is an entrepreneurial spirit when people have their own skin in the game uh, that oftentimes is more effective than policymakers sitting in a boardroom in Ottawa. And, and I'm curious, how can we conduct an exercise that will give us confidence that the support that we're putting out there into the marketplace is actually reaching viable businesses and not uh, just delaying the inevitable for businesses that weren't structurally sound going into this pandemic? Exactly. And and that's the great conundrum. And I don't believe that it should be uh, politicians or bureaucrats in Ottawa that should be making those decisions. I think businesses themselves and even the hardest hit sectors, some will be big winners uh, because they're making adjustments. And it, I mean, there's so many examples of, the, of them where the businesses that have learned to do business remotely or to provide safe, literally safe, um, services and goods in a very uh, user-friendly way it are going to outperform. And that's going to be different for every sector of the economy. And so you can't have blanket money giveaways. And it's and I do believe that there ought to be private public coordination in terms of, of just how these assessments should be made. At I mean, as an economist, I have to say we need to let the markets work. And that means that if you aren't creditworthy, you shouldn't be able to borrow money. Now, if you aren't creditworthy for a moment in time, for a short period when you're cash strapped for very good reasons, you've been forced not to open your doors and your fixed costs are being paid, that's one thing. But uh, unfortunately, what this pandemic has done is showed us who the weak players were to begin with. And many of those people will not reopen their doors, nor should we subsidize them to make them do so because it, it's an inefficient allocation of resources and very unfair to the taxpayer. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our panelists. This has been terrific. I wish I had another hour of questions, but I'll cut her off there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, Mr. St. Marie next, followed by Mr. Julian uh, Gabriel. Oui, merci, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne, gentlemen and ma'am. Thank you very much for your presentations and your presence this afternoon. They've been extremely interesting. My questions are for Mr. Danjou. So thank you for your attendance and thank you for your presentation as well. It's quite worrisome to hear you say that this current crisis has few historic financial crises. It can't compare. In fact, it brings us back to wartime. Now on a much more down to earth topic, my first question for you is this. So how do you go about negotiating with the government? That is, the government puts in a request. Uh, it puts in a request uh, for assistance for the pandemic and with partners. And uh, there are a number of partners involved in the emergency account. So exactly how do you go about doing the negotiation? It's a good question. I'm not aware of all of the negotiations, but thank you for the question. But right now, we are quite comfortable in our relationship. Uh, it's. Uh, we have a number of different programs underway, more specifically with companies. We're very comfortable with this. We've taken on more or less the same approach as to the relief measures we needed to act quickly to provide support to those who were greatly impacted by this economic pause. 
I can't really speak to how the negotiations are going, but we are quite comfortable in playing this partnership role with government to support our clients. Thank you. As well, I was absolutely amazed by the statistic that you pulled out, the one that you referred to. You said, and if I understood you correctly, it's 950 thousand requests for relief among your members. Is that correct? Yes, this includes everything. You might have one member putting in several applications. It could be for mortgages. It can be about credit cards. We have a quite a number of different programs available as well as for companies where we have an emergency loan available as well for households. We have different relief programs and we believe that it's important to support people not only to provide relief efforts. And I think it's very important that we undertake this transition right now. We have a lot of people who receive revenue support uh, to pay for their mortgages. They're able to overcome this. But what we need to do is to avoid arriving at a point where everything happens at the same time. No money is coming in anymore because the relief programs are over. You cannot pay your mortgage, as, et cetera. I think we need to move towards the transition. We have to ensure that people are able to get back to work, to find a job so that they're able to cover mortgage payments, et cetera. But we realize that this isn't going to happen overnight and that we'll need to continue supporting our clients. Thank you very much. In fact, this transition period will be vital and it will be important to have a proper modeling of the definition of these transition measures we need. Uh, CERB has been referred to, and that's not based on uh, the income we made, such as $1,000. When you make $1,000 and when you lose everything, we understand that during the first weeks, the government was unable to factor all of this into it, but it's been three months now. I think we need to incite people to go back to work. But before I come to questions, about these specific measures. You also said in your presentation that because of the pandemic, we're putting the economy on pause deliberately and we'll come back and it should run well after this. Except that one of my concerns is as follows. Of course, there will be some sectors of the economy that will not be able to rebound to the point that they were at previously. Habits will have changed. The post-crisis will not be identical to the pre-crisis time. This was mentioned by your colleague as well. But regarding those sectors that will have some difficulty, for example, neighborhood businesses, uh, let's say people uh, start getting used to buying online more and more. What do we do about, uh, for example, local jobs? These are important jobs and important companies and important services as well. So as far as you're concerned, what can the government do to support those people working in these specific sectors, these sectors that will not rebound at the to the same levels as they were uh, in pre prior to the pandemic. Well, it all depends on how the pandemic evolves. It all depends on the opening measures. At the beginning, there was no choice. We could not choose between the economy and health. I think we all agree on that. But I think Quebec, we've also seen the experience. We had almost complete lockdown. We saw that it certainly helped, but it wasn't a magic solution. And I think in the coming months, there might be a bit of a comeback. We'll have to make sure that we have the proper health measures in place, but we really will have to choose the best measures. Perhaps wearing a mask is the best protective measures. But of course, if you keep those two meters distancing, of course, and then you cannot go to a cinema and restaurants. All of these businesses will have to find a means of coping. For the time being, I think we need to find the best means of achieving the right health outcomes, all the while sending specific messages to these specific sectors. They're opening up now, but there is still complete uncertainty, so it will be very difficult. So I think it's going to be important for them to benefit from uh, good financing. But right now in Quebec and elsewhere in North America, we are in a labor shortage position. So some people will be losing their jobs, uh, but perhaps we have a possibility of sending them to another sector and to send them to other jobs. Certainly, this will require a certain amount of adaptation. In Quebec, for instance, a lot of companies would limit development because they didn't have enough labor and they needed highly trained labor. So perhaps these companies might not or might take over from those sectors that will be seeing a gradual decline. But uh, there might be surprises. Uh, we've seen retail stores since the reopening. There are a lot of people going in. A lot of things will change. I think that telework is here to stay.
but we might be surprised and people might start to travel more quickly than we had thought. Uh, over, you'll get a second round uh, anyway, Gabriel, I think. Um, going then to uh, Mr. Uh, Julian, uh, and after that, Mr. Morantz. Uh, Peter? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to all our witnesses. We hope that uh, your, you and your families are safe and healthy through this pandemic. Uh, I am very anxious to ask you some questions, Mr. McDonald, and thank you so much for uh, your presentation and the information that you've brought. Uh, Mr. Polyev has asked questions about banking support. That's, uh, that's great. I, I feel like he's uh, starting to shift away from traditional conservative ideology. Um, and of course, I think the the lessons learned from the last crisis uh, are important. So when the Harper government was uh, in power uh, and we went through the financial crisis a little over a decade ago, what is your, your evaluation of the overall supports offered to the banking sector? Um, were there conditions to that? And what are the lessons learned? Mr. McDonald. You mean conditions during 2008 or conditions during yes. the, the present? Yeah. For, for, for the bank supports that were put into place, what's your evaluation of the amount? And what were the conditions attached to that, if any? And what are the lessons that, uh, that from that, uh, those supports that you think uh, we need to think about uh, this time around? Well, there, there were a few conditions, uh, as there are this time around, in terms of uh, accessing some of those supports. The programs were actually, in some ways, quite similar. Uh, you know, the Bank of Canada, particularly engaging in uh, large-scale repo operations with the, the banks, uh, CMHC itself engaging in, in mortgage buybacks, uh, and then many of the Canadian banks accessing American facilities as well through the Federal Reserve. This time around, um, uh, you know, during that last period, we had supports, you know, maximum supports, I think, topped out in the $130 billion range. Um, we're, I'm, I'm sure I haven't really done the full, the full numbers here. I'm sure we're in, in excess of that this time around. Although what the banks are using is very different. And so this time around, the Bank of Canada's uh, repo operations have been much more substantial. And there's been almost no take up of CMHC's uh, mortgage buyback program in stark contrast to what happened in 2008, where it was the complete reverse and there was much more interaction with the, with the mortgage buyback program. Now, that program continues. Uh, and so there may well be some, I mean, the, the, the deferral of mortgages of 14% of all mortgages in a deferral situation is, is extraordinary. Uh, that will presumably go down to some degree between now and September, but I, I, there, it may well be that if deferrals continue, the, the banks may be inclined to, uh, to send more of their mortgages to CMHC if they, you know, if they start to go bust. Um, in that regard, I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, I think it is positive that OSFI's rules this time around in terms of limiting share buybacks uh, from the big banks. I mean, that has been a positive change. I don't think the, the capping of dividends and executive pay uh, really does much in the sense that in three of the five banks already had increases in place. And so in, in many cases, those dividends will have increased in any event. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, th thank you. But you, you raised the point and, and in your presentation, which was excellent, about, uh, for example, the prepayment penalties as people are emerged and not able to keep up their, their mortgage uh, payments, the penalties and fees and compound interest charges for mortgage deferrals, uh, the fact that uh, we haven't seen the banking sector do anything uh, like uh, certain credit unions, Van City and, and Community Savings, that have dropped their interest rates to zero. What are the impacts when we provide so much support to the banking sector, but there's uh, no responsibility to pass that on uh, to people that are struggling, small businesses in my area, uh, people that are struggling with uh, consumer debt, people that are really having difficulty make ends meet, but uh, it appears that they're just going to be part of the windfall profits that go to the banking sector. The deferral program itself is, is premised on uh, OSFI's exemption of the banks um, in terms of increased, I mean, what would have otherwise happened is that these, these, these loans would have been considered non-performing. And the moment they become non-performing, then all of a sudden the banks need to put up more uh, in terms of capital to back them. Not to say that those people are bankrupt, just to say that the, the banks need to put up more money to back them. Um, and as a result, those are tangible increased costs for the banks, particularly when you know, in some cases, 18% of all mortgages are in, a, are in a deferral position. And so this change to the OSFI rule um, that uh, provides material benefit to the banks allows for this deferral program. 
Now, I mean, I would certainly argue that that this benefit that OSFI has provided to the banks could be used or, you know, the, that the committees like this one could request that the banks in trade for this uh, this rule change uh, defer mortgage, defer uh, penalties as well as interest charges over the over the period of the deferral. This would be much more important for, for credit cards and, and lines of credit. I, you know, it could be useful for mortgages as well. Um, I mean, I think that we haven't really encountered this yet because the deferral program is in place. And so anyone who had difficulty paying a mortgage would go into the deferral program. Um, it's really, I think, when the deferral program starts to wind down that we'll see this start to play a much bigger role. And that is the penalties for prepayments of mortgages. This is particularly true for fixed rate mortgages. Uh, it exists for variable rate, but they're lower in general. And so I think that in preparation for that, this committee could uh, could discuss this with banks and encourage them to waive most or all of the penalties of prepayments of mortgages uh, as Canadians attempt to downsize in essence, if you know job losses that they thought were temporary become permanent, so the deferral period is over, they still don't have a job and they need to downsize. I think we need to make it as easy as possible for people to do that without undue penalties that would have to be paid to break mortgages. Thank, thank you so much. And the $5 billion that banks have made so far during this pandemic, I think, is something that the public certainly observes. Uh, the PBO has just produced a report that is shocking, I think, to most Canadians, showing the concentration of wealth being much, much higher, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, uh, than the, the former government statistics uh, indicated, 25% of the wealth in the hands of the top 1%. Uh, do you feel uh, that one of the things that we need to, ch to do to, to, as we come through this pandemic and out of this pandemic is envisage a wealth tax on that massive concentration of wealth? Uh, certainly the Broadbent uh, Institute did an did a opinion poll and even the majority of conservative voters believe now in a wealth tax. Do you think a measure like that could make a difference to starting to uh, hit this record level of inequality that we're seeing in our country? and uh, build a, uh, a broader based, uh, more equal society? A fairly tight answer if we could, uh, Mr. McDonald. I don't think that we're at the stage yet of discussing uh, increases in taxation, but I think that we will soon be at the stage of discussing cuts in programs in order to reduce deficits, particularly provincially, but also potentially federally. And so, I mean, you can balance the books two ways. You can increase taxes uh, or you can decrease expenditures. And so I think that uh, new thinking around taxation, particularly a wealth tax, is certainly one way that we could increase taxes instead of cutting expenditures, which is the other choice. And I think we will see increasing pressure in the fall to do that.